Good afternoon. I'm Beth McGrath. I'm Vice President for University Relations and Chief of Staff to President Prevardin, whom you'll hear from in uh, just a few minutes. This is the State of Stevens Address, and it's part of our first ever Fall Festival at Stevens. This is um, a celebratory gathering for faculty, staff, students, alumni, friends, and neighbors. Um, we had over 3,000 people register for the Fall Festival for the two-day events last evening and, and today. I want to just make sure to uh, mention that this evening will culminate in um, a celebration of the lighting of the Empire State Building in Stevens Red. That will happen at 6.30 at the Babio, Platio, Babio <laughs> Patio, say that three times fast, um, and there will be a three-foot Empire State Building cake that uh, will sweeten our celebration. So uh, we're going to kick off the session now with uh, a new video that um, describes Stevens and our, our secret sauce, and then you'll hear from President Favarden himself. This is the Stevens. This is Stevens' video. At Stevens Institute of Technology, every day brings exciting new opportunities to advance human progress, fuel the innovation economy, and create technologies that make our world a better place. While we have been a center for innovation since 1870, the Stevens of today is built on a solid foundation of progress and impact in every facet of academics, research, and campus culture. Over the last decade, Stevens has distinguished itself as a premier student-centric university on a remarkable upward trajectory. We are an agile, technology-focused institution located in the heart of one of the most vibrant corporate and technology centers in the world. And we have set an even more ambitious course for our future, a course that will extend and amplify our positive impact on students and the world. At the heart of our mission is the conviction that our world needs more big thinkers, people whose groundbreaking research, creativity, and ambition turn ideas into solutions in areas like artificial intelligence, fintech, quantum, biotechnology, and sustainability. Our industry-relevant curriculum shapes tomorrow's problem solvers for an era of unprecedented technological change. Hands-on experiences, top-tier partnerships with corporations and government, and a prime location lead to powerful outcomes for our graduates and pioneering solutions to real-world problems. Stephen students, faculty, and researchers are inspired by humanity and powered by technology. We aspire to change our world as we reach for the stars. We hope you'll share that video and connect with us on social media to expand uh, the reputation uh, to those of you those in the world who don't know about Stevens as well as, as you do. Uh, I also wanted to welcome not only those who are here sitting with us in the audience, there are several dozen who are watching uh, this via live stream as well. So let me invite President Pervardin to come to the stage uh, and please help me welcome him. Uh, <clears throat> is my mic on? Ladies and gentlemen, good uh, afternoon. I hope you're doing well and enjoying uh, Fall Fest. Uh, we uh, arranged a picture perfect day for, for your arrival, and I hope you take advantage of this opportunity to walk around the campus, participate in different activities, and I want to thank you for, for being here. I am joined here by a number of my colleagues in the cabinet. I see Vice President Sarah Klein sitting back there. Sarah, can you please wave at uh, our guests? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Vice President Beth McGrath was uh, uh, just introduced herself, Vice President for University Relations, Vice President Laura Rose, Vice President for Development and Alumni Engagement. 
And uh, the provost and senior vice president for academic affairs was here until a few minutes ago. I think he probably is not in the audience. And so was um, uh, Robert Mafia, the vice president for uh, facilities and campus operations. So if you bump into them during the afternoon, please say hello. I wanted to thank all of them for working very hard for a long, long time to uh, work with their colleagues to organize uh, this event. As you heard from uh, Beth McGrath, we are expecting uh, north of 3,000 visitors. These are alumni, students, uh, parents of students, neighbors, uh, faculty, staff, um, joining the university, part, becoming part of our campus community. Um, the intent of this uh, presentation is just to give you a little overview of what is going on at Stevens. I'll keep my presentation short, but I would like you to participate and engage in the discussion. So I will keep the main presentation very short, and I expect you to ask me questions and make comments at the end so that we can make it as interactive as possible. Is that okay? That's a deal? All right. Now, I gave exactly the same presentation this morning, and I will be very bored if I repeat the same thing over again. So I'll do my best to digress, but quite frankly, at this moment, I don't exactly know how I'm going to digress, so I'm going to kind of wing it. All right. The first thing that I uh, want to do is to tell you about ways in which this university is at least somewhat, and in some cases significantly, different from others. I always find this a very important statement uh, that I make because especially prospective students and their parents, and I know that you're not prospective, you're part of our community already, but especially prospective students and their parents always want to know how the universities are different from each other because the similarities of the, student, of the universities do not help them in making a decision which one to pick. It is the differences that will help you understand whether this university is a good fit for you or not a good fit for you. So what is special about this university? First of all, we are extremely proud about the rigor and depth of the educational experience that we give our students here. If there are some students in the audience who are maybe first year students, they can already attest to the level of rigor that they have experienced in the past 20 days. Are you, are you a student here? I am a master's student. You are a master's student, but where, did you do your undergrad here? No. You do not, so you, you can't attest to that yet, but, um, but I, I, I guarantee you that is the case. In addition to that, Stevens has uh, made an effort to ensure that our educational, uh, that our students' educational experience is related to the real world. So experiential learning is another important aspect of the experience here. The second thing is that we call ourselves Stevens Institute of Technology. The key word here is technology. We have, we've been called that for 152 years. We are particularly proud of our commitment to technology in everything that we do. We embrace technology in our education programs. We embrace technology in our outreach programs. We embrace technology in how we run the university in the administration of the university. We are strong believers that technology is a principal driver of human progress. And on the one hand, we are inspired by humanity. We care about making the world a better place. And on the other hand, we believe technology is a very powerful tool in order to affect that change. So by embracing technology, we differentiate ourselves from most of the rest of higher education. There are a few other universities that have that high level of commitment to embracing technology. I mean, I can give you a few examples. You look at Carnegie Mellon University, it's quite similar. MIT is quite similar. Caltech, quite similar. But most of the rest of higher education is not like that. So <clears throat> the average student who graduates from this university is far more technologically literate and technology savvy 
than a student who graduates from most other institutions. This gives our graduates a leg up. I always give this example. If you work for a company like, I don't know, JP Morgan, and you're looking for talent in the area of finance, and you identify two people, one from a strong finance program in University X, and another one from the quantitative finance program from Stevens Institute of Technology. You compare these two, their knowledge of finance are quite comparable. One of them is really technology savvy. The other one is not. Which one will you pick? It's a no-brainer. The third thing is that from the day this university was founded in 1870, there was a commitment to innovation and entrepreneurship, perhaps inherited from the founding family of the, of the university. We're also a close-knit family. We are a small community. We care about each other. We know each other. Faculty know students. Students know staff members. Students help students. And that creates a very spe special culture here. Oftentimes when I speak with students or parents of students who are in their first year and I ask them, what were some of the key reasons you decided to join this university as opposed to other universities you were admitted to? One thing, one message that I hear kind of consistently is that I felt at home. I felt like I'm joining a new family at Stevens, and there is a tremendous amount of truth to this. I must tell you, I've been at Stevens now a long time. It's 11 years, a little more than 11 years. But the first year I joined Stevens in 2011, I felt like I have a new, larger family. And that happened in no time. Um, I hope you agree that we have a magnificently beautiful campus. It's outrageously beautiful. Uh, you will see uh, our campus is even more beautiful in the evening than it is during the day because of the colorful skyline of, uh, of Manhattan. Um, but it's not only the beauty of our campus, it is not only the location in uh, a vibrant, uh, very livable city of Hoboken, but it's an unparalleled access to opportunity provided by the New York metropolitan area, which is one of the most economically and technologically vibrant cities on the face of uh, the planet. Um, we are very proud about the efficiency and agility with which this university um, uh, reacts to what is happening in the world. Um, we live in a very dynamic world. Things change very quickly. Uh, opportunities arise in no time. And uh, challenges arise even faster than opportunities. So uh, as a result of uh, the dynamism in this world, as a result of the rate and the pace with which opportunities and challenges come and go, if you're not fast, you can quickly fall behind. I don't know if you know this, but during the short period between early 2020 and today, during the pandemic period, 100 universities have disappeared. Did you know that? 100 universities in this country that were open in early 2020 have disappeared. That tells you something about the failure to be able to respond to a significant challenge. In the same period of time, some other universities have become stronger. Because as you all know, in any crisis, there is an opportunity. Some universities realized that. They took advantage of COVID as an opportunity. And now, in the semi-post-COVID era, those universities are thriving. I'm very happy to report that this university happens to be one of them. And finally, as I will share with you in a moment, there is a tremendous amount of excitement. There is momentum. There is, there is energy here in this university because of an incredible ascent to higher levels of achievement and prominence and distinction over the course of the past decade. And I will show you a few examples of what I mean by that. So I thought I would <clears throat> give you a little bit of a history. I will do this very quickly. This university was founded in 1870. 
152 years ago by the first family, uh, by the first American family of innovators and entrepreneurs. This family's, uh, the patriarch of this family was Colonel John Stevens, whose picture is on the left here. Uh, Colonel John Stevens was a colonel in, jo in George Washington's army. Uh, at the same time, he was the treasurer of the state of New Jersey. So he was a military man. At the same time, he understood finance. That's how he ended up becoming the treasurer. And uh, he had an amazingly uh, analytical mind. And uh, he was very I interested and very talented in solving some of the most challenging engineering problems of the time. Now, remember, we're talking a long time ago. We are talking about late 1700s, early 1800s. So at that time, Colonel John and some members of his family, particularly noteworthy three of his sons, he built a family business. And the family business essentially revolved around uh, these people developing more advanced steam engine technologies. Steam engine was in vogue at the time. There was a competition between the United States and Europe to develop better, more efficient uh, steam engines. So this particular family was quite adept at improving steam engines. And every time they came up with a new innovation, they built a new business around it. So these business, businesses included uh, the first commercial ferry that was developed because of a new propeller, double propeller steam engine that you can see in this boat over here that became the first commercial ferry service between Manhattan and Hoboken. It also included the first steamboat that navigated open waters. It was called Phoenix and the first steam locomotive, um, uh, a replica of which actually exists in our library. If you haven't had a chance to go to the library, go see the replica. Um, all of these are contributions of, of this family. In addition to that, particularly noteworthy is the fact that Colonel John petitioned to the United States Congress the establishment of the US patent law. So, the fact that we have a mechanism for protecting intellectual property in this country today in 2022 is thanks to the foresight of Colonel John. One of the three sons that Colonel John worked with very closely was Edwin. Edwin A. Stevens, the man who is pictured in the middle, he um, of course inherited part of the, he participated in this uh, enterprise with, with the father and the, and the other brothers inherited a lot of wealth, and in 1868 he passed, but left a will uh, that required a part of his estate to be used to create the first College of Mechanical Engineering in the United States. And he was a fortunate man, like, like many of us are, in that he had a wife who delivered on the wishes of her late husband. That lady, pictured on the right, is Martha Baird Stevens, Edwin's wife, who in 1868, after he passed, took a part of the state and worked with various constituencies, and two years later, in 1870, created the university that you're visiting today. So that's a brief history of Stevens Institute of Technology. If you want to know more, feel free to ask me questions. Um, what does the university look like today, 152 years later? We uh, are a sizable university. We are still, I would call us a medium-sized university. We are less than 10,000, but pretty close to 10,000 students total. We have a little more than 4,000 undergraduate students, a little more than 5,000 graduate students of which the majority are on campus, but we have a sizable online master's degree program. So the online students are not on campus. They're all over the world. We have more than 1,000 full-time faculty and staff members. We have an annual research operation 
a little north of $60 million, and the annual budget of the university is about $370 million per year. The academic enterprise, which is headed by the provost and uh, senior vice president for academic affairs, consists of four units, the largest of which is the School of Engineering and Science, uh, followed by the School of Business, followed by the School of Systems and Enterprises, and finally, the College of Arts and Letters. So the School of Engineering and Science, obviously, as suggested by its name, includes most engineering majors plus uh, most science majors. Chemistry, physics, mathematics, biology, computer science, all of those, <clears throat> plus most engineering. The School of Business uh, includes most disciplines that are typically the School of Business finance, quantitative finance, accounting, marketing, business, management, information systems, uh, economics, and the like. The School of Systems and Enterprises is kind of a very unique school in the sense that most other universities do not have a school. Uh, we do in that the School of Systems essentially focuses on not individual in, um, engineering disciplines, but how individual engineering disciplines and business-related disciplines work together in the context of a large and complex system. For example, <clears throat> you know, in a Boeing 747, where there are thousands, maybe tens of thousands of, uh, of uh, manufacturers that contribute to building different parts, how do you build the system where the parts come from different companies, different parts of the world, so that all these parts work together synergistically to build an aircraft that actually takes off and can take 500 persons with it in the air. It's a non-trivial undertaking. Another large and complex system I can give you an example of is the large and complicated and fundamentally flawed healthcare system of the United States. There are so many players in the game. Another complex system is our energy grid. You know, the sources of energy come from different parts of the country. There are different transmission lines. There are different users. There are some users during the day. There are some users during the night. There are some users that are constantly drawing energy. There are some users that are intermittent, intermittent users. Very, very complex. How do you build the system to be, uh, to, to be stable? Uh, how do you build the system to provide um, uh, the electricity where it is needed and when it is needed, and how do you build the system in order to make sure that it is not vulnerable to cyber attacks. Very multidimensional large system. And finally, our Co College of Arts and Letters is uh, the, um, the more liberal arts and artsy-oriented part of our university. It offers programs in English, in philosophy, in history, in uh, uh, quantitative social science, in uh, music, but music with a very strong orientation toward te technology in the arts and visual arts, again, with a very strong orientation to technology. The takeaway from this talk, I, I thought I would tell you about the takeaways before I I actually go over some details. First of all, is the tremendous momentum that this university enjoys and significant achievements that are themselves moving the university forward at an accelerated rate. Secondly, um, a significant amount of uh, external recognition and accolades that the university has, has received and continues to receive from external organizations, uh, leading to an increased value of the degree that this university offers. And finally, um, an incredible amount of improvement and progress in, um, in uh, modernizing and expanding the physical infrastructure in our university. So with that in mind, I have one slide that looks a little bit overwhelming because it has lots and lots of numbers, but I will walk you through it. And at the end, I hope you agree with me that there is one only one important message in this slide. So please only look at this column here and the highlighted in yellow column over here. 
So what this slide says, and I'm going to go through this very quickly, it says over the past decade approximately, the number of applications we receive for incoming first year students has gone up 250%. The enrollment has gone up 68%. The academic profile of the students that join our university, that enroll here, as measured by median SAT score, have gone up 165 points. The university is more diverse in that the percentage of women has gone up 13 percentage points, the percentage of underrepresented minorities up 8 percentage points, graduation rate is up 9 percentage points, graduate applications have gone up 360 percent, graduate enrollment is up, faculty size is up, research awards up, operating revenue up, philanthropic support up, and everything else up. What is the message? <laughs> exactly. This university is breaking the rules. This university is bucking the trend. This is not the case in all of the rest of higher education in the United States. In fact, in a lot of universities, it's down and down and down and down and down again. Something very unusual is happening here. I think that is the key message that I wanted to share with you. And just to bring a little bit of a, a lightness here to the discussion, I want to pause on uh, the first couple of points. I, I noted that the undergraduate enrollment has gone up about 68%. Um, that is a significant amount of growth in, in a university. <clears throat> so uh, just 10 years ago, 11 years ago, we had only 2,400 undergraduate students, and now we have close to 4,100. <clears throat> so usually when universities grow, they compromise quality. That's how these two things work. You want to grow, you compromise quality. You want to improve quality, you become smaller. You become more selective. Well, what has happened at Stevens is that we have grown 68%, and the SAT score of the students uh, uh, has gone up 165 points. So a few years ago, I used to kind of joke in, in presentations like this with an audience like, like you. I would say, if the president of the university were to apply to the university, he would not be able to get in. Today, it is not a joke anymore. It is true. I mean, 165 points means the median SAT score of the students who joined our University this fall was 1445. That's the median. A good number of students come in with SATs of 1600 or 1580 or something like that. So I'm sure the president would not have been able to get that high up. So in addition to all of those accomplishments, we have um, placed a lot of energy, a lot of investment, a lot of time in creating a, an infrastructure, both an information technology infrastructure and a physical plant that would support our aspirations of becoming a better, a more prestigious, a more high quality, a more effective, a more nationally well-known, and a somewhat larger university. So we have invested a lot in our IT infrastructure, and I can tell you we probably have one of the most advanced information technology infrastructures in any university in the country. And we have invested a lot in our physical plant, as uh, demonstrated here by some of these uh, pictures over here. Uh, you notice that we, ba we built uh, eight major buildings, or we've uh, got it and completely renovated those buildings, and about 300 smaller projects. The last time I counted, the total dollar investment in our physical plant has been uh, about one half of a billion dollars. And the picture that you see here is one uh, that I find beautiful. I hope you all agree. This is a picture on, on the left. It's a picture of the building you're in. This, bu this building is brand new. Uh, I'm assuming some of you are here for the first time. Do we have anybody who's here for the first time? Yeah, a good number of you for the first time. If you haven't had a chance to see the rest of the building, give yourself an opportunity to take a tour. Um, and uh, as you notice here, uh, the beautiful Stevens uh, sign shines on top of this building. And uh, again, it took us 152 years to get permission <laughs> to
to put our sign on top of a building that actually doesn't even face Hoboken, it faces Manhattan. Manhattan had no objections all this 152 years. Uh, but finally we got the permit and we're very happy. But it's the juxtaposition of where we are against the uh, Hudson Yards in Manhattan, one of the most vibrant cities in the world, I think is, is a telling juxtaposition. And it, it, it is a very simple way of explaining what I always say. It's an unparalleled access to opportunity. It is true, unparalleled access to opportunity. As a result of all of these, the university's reputation is on the rise. Uh, there are lots of uh, awards and recognitions and accolades that the university receive, such as uh, Forbes magazine calling us the turnaround university, or the American Council on Education giving us the Institutional Transformation Award, or the Carnegie Corporation of New York uh, giving Stevens the Academic Leadership Award, the only university in the state of New Jersey that has ever received this recognition from the Carnegie Corporation. This is a uh, very prestigious recognition. Uh, over the course of the four months between mid-February to mid-May 2022, this university has received about 5,500 mentions in prominent media outlets such as, you know, the Washington Post and CBS News and Newsweek and Forbes and all kinds of different places representing 164% growth only in one year. So that tells you the university is becoming a better place, its reputation is increasing, and this is not what I am saying. This is what the external world is saying. Of course, I feel very good about it. The other thing that we feel very good about and we are uh, immensely proud of is the achievement of our athletic programs and our student athletes. Last year, um, we won 13 conference championships in our conference, and the little Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken was ranked 10th in the whole country among all 440 or 450 Division III universities. Um, in, in, incredible achievement. Uh, last night, we had a beautiful event to recognize a number of uh, uh, alumni athletes into the innovation in, into the athletic hall of fame and these are pictures of some of the winning teams that uh, uh, that made us very proud last year i will not go through the details but i will tell you that our wrestling team made it to the top five and uh, one wrestler won national championship in 149 pounds by the way, I saw him three days after the championship ended, and he weighed 162 pounds. <laughs> he had done an amazing job of losing 13 pounds. It takes me two, it takes me two years to lose two pounds, and he did it uh, in no time. And our, uh, our men's volleyball team also made it in, uh, in the uh, top five. Um, for your information, uh, this afternoon, uh, men's soccer is playing at 4 o'clock. I'm going to be there. I hope to see some of you there. Also, women's volleyball is playing at 4 o'clock, and I'm going to switch back and forth between men's soccer and women's volleyball. Men's soccer is currently ranked third in the whole country. It's a phenomenal team. Remains undefeated, by the way. So 4 o'clock promises to be a great event. Our research programs are growing by leaps and bounds, ranging from um, research in alternative energy energy production, energy storage, to cancer research and drug discovery, to artificial intelligence with its vast array of applications, to financial technologies, and I'll come back to this for a second, to quantum technologies and devices. We have a long history of excellence in urban and coastal resiliency, a lot of strength in robotics and precision navigation, and uh, exciting, truly exciting, possibly path-breaking uh, research in the area of uh, brain with a special emphasis on understanding uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Uh, I'd like to, I have one more slide to tell you a little more about FinTech and about quantum because these are recent developments and we are very excited about them. In FinTech, the National Science Foundation, which is the most authoritative funding agency 
supporting science in this country, decided that the United States is losing its competitiveness in the area of financial technologies. And they decided to establish, this was about two years ago, to establish a major center uh, in research, bringing universities and corporations together to work on financial technologies. I am uh, truly honored to tell you that Stevens Institute of Technology is that university. We were selected last August of 2021. Um, we have created a center called, uh, NSF calls it Industry University Collaborative Research Center. And this center, over its very short life, has already attracted members such as Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, Vanguard, Charles, uh, Charles Schwab, Bank of America, UBS, and a lot of other major households. So we are the authoritative university in the nation in this extremely important uh, area of fintech with significant um, importance for our national competitiveness. The second area where we are uh, making amazing progress and uh, it is possible that the work that is being done at Stevens will lead the way for uh, possibly the next technological revolution is in the area of quantum, building devices and technologies that would enable quantum computing and quantum communications. And as you can see in this picture over here, the technologies that have come out of our laboratory uh, were licensed to a company that was founded by this faculty member, Professor Yu Ping Wong, who um, has founded a company called Quantum Computing, and it's being traded now on NASDAQ, and on July 20th, they actually uh, rang the closing bell uh, at uh, NASDAQ uh, Market Exchange. So very, very exciting. I have run out of time and out of breath. It's now your turn. So thank you very much for being here, and the floor is open for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And there are microphones floating around, so I just need a few brave volunteers. Yes. Hello. Uh, talking a little bit deeper into the FinTech, are, are we talking more about blockchain and crypto in that universe, or is it a different direction than that? Uh, blockchains uh, and crypto are included, and a lot more. So I'll tell you a little bit how this works. This is supposed to be the center in the nation in the area of fintech, and therefore it cannot be that narrow. The corporate members of our center, when they, when they become a member, and they, well, after they pay the, their membership fee, they join an advisory board of the center. The research areas of the center then will be selected, um, not, not selected, but advised by the advisory board. So right now, if I can go back there, Goldman Sachs and Wells Fargo and Vanguard and Schwab and, and the others have a member representing their company on the advisory board. So they meet and they say, from our perspective, an important research project that our companies are interested in is in crypto. So that becomes a research project for the next three years. And then they look at the available amount of funding and they say there is enough funding available for three other projects. So maybe another one would be cybersecurity as applied to fintech. Or it could be, what did you say, blockchains. Or a whole host of other things. Machine learning. Machine learning as applied to Market research, for example. Other questions? Yes, there's a question back there. Yeah. The, microphone is right. the microphone is coming to you. Okay. No, no rush. Thank you. Thanks for a great presentation and lots of great information. And congratulations on all the growth. Uh, and that's my question. I'm thinking about the unique location you have here, um, uh, and, and also how difficult it is to find parking sometimes in Hoboken, uh, and how, what, I'm sure you have some thoughts about how you will sustain the growth uh, with uh, the 
unique location here? Very good question. So, um, by the way, we don't have a parking problem anymore. We, we built a nice parking garage, <clears throat> and thanks to COVID, um, people don't travel to campus quite as much as they used to. Um, but to answer your question, uh, 11 years ago, when we embarked on this journey that included a lot of growth, our university, in my opinion, was too small. You see, in higher education, size matters. In a lot of other business, businesses, size matters too. But in higher education in particular, size matters a lot. Um, I think I did mention that over the course of the past two, two and a half years, 100 universities have gone belly up. All of these universities were small. And you know why size matters? Because you need the economy of scales to kick in. Otherwise, you know, a university with 1,000 students needs a president, needs a provost, needs a bunch of deans, needs a vice president for this and a vice president for that and a vice president for that. If you increase the size from 1,000 to 10,000, you're not going to add nine other presidents. You see what I mean by economies of scale? So 10 years ago, we were too small. The economies of scale had not kicked in. Now we are of a very good size, in my opinion. So the first part of my answer to your question is, we do not have plans to grow at the same rate we have grown. We probably will grow a little bit, but much more modestly. It's number one. Number two, as you pointed out correctly, we are very much landlocked. Uh, so if we want to grow, how do we grow our physical infrastructure? And the answer is twofold. There is a modest amount of space left for building a new building. Uh, fortunately, uh, we are zoned properly, so if we build a building, we can go this way as opposed to going this way. So that is one opportunity. And then the other opportunity is that we have a number of fairly old and very flat buildings. Those buildings don't need to be to stay that way. In the long term, those buildings can be knocked down and replaced by more modern, more vertical buildings. These are the two opportunities that allow us to continue to grow some, but I go back to the point that I made earlier. Our plans for the future is to become, to, to place more of our energy on impact, on name recognition, on prestige, not on size. Our size is very healthy now. You're welcome. Other questions? Yes, up front. The microphone is coming to you. Congratulations again for, for all the uh, progressive numbers you presented. It, it, uh, it speaks so much for the leadership of, of Stevens, I think. And in one of the slides you presented, there was a, I think about a 9% increase in gender. Yep. And I was wondering, what other programs do you have to increase that number? Or do you think that that number is, has been maximized? Or what, what are the plans of the university, of the uh, school on that? Thank you. So this question is about gender diversity. <clears throat> 10, 11 years ago, we had only 24% of our student population being women. Today, it's seven, 37%. So did I say 9%? We've gone from 24, we've gone from 24 to 37. We've improved 13 percentage, not nine. Number one, small correction. But uh, <clears throat> have we maximized? No way. We will be maximized when we're 50%. All right, so that is our goal. No question about that. You probably do know that um, in science and engineering and technology oriented universities in general, there is an endemic national issue of lower participation by women, okay? We don't, we don't necessarily, uh, we, we don't feel that because this is a national problem, we need to have that problem. So we are determined to continue to work on this and increase the percentage to 50%. It will take some time, no question about that. But we are doing a whole host of different things to make Stevens a more supportive 
and a more inviting place for women. I'll give you one example of something that we did this semester for the first time. We are creating some living learning programs in our dormitories. So students, of, uh, students with similar interests will be living together in one dorm. Okay, and we've created one such uh, living learning program for women only. So uh, these are um, kind of baby steps. We take lots and lots of baby steps and hopefully collectively they will help, help us achieve the long-term goal that we have. Going from 24% to 37% has not happened as a result of an accident. It has happened as a result of a deliberate effort over um, this 11 year period. Yes, ma'am. Very actively, very actively. We, we're leaving no stone unturned. Every uh, activity that comes to your mind where you think there might be an opportunity to get more women interested in joining Stevens, we participate in. Our admissions office has a very um, deliberate program specifically reaching out to women. And in fact, since you asked that question, I'll tell you something that might be maybe even a little confidential, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, we have a new vice president for enrollment management who oversees our admissions and financial aid operation. And one of the things she's planning to do, uh, and I have to choose my words very carefully here, is to have a specific office dedicated to enhancing the diversity of our student population, in particular gender diversity. So there's going to be an, uh, a set of uh, activities uh, with direct report to the vice president focused on recruiting more women. Other questions? Yes, there's a question back there. Oh. Why, why don't we go here and then we go back there, yes. Dr. Prevardin, as a proud alumnus and who was present at your inauguration, I'm truly um, thrilled for all that you have done over the past uh, 11 years. And I would just have a couple of questions about, two questions specifically. Um, the first being, um, it's wonderful to see that there's about a two-fold increase in minority students um, in the past decade. What plans do you have to uh, improve the diversity and equity on campus? Because this will allow our university to thrive and interconnect with the major worldwide community in addition to just adding additional languages for all of the students to um, collaborate together to um, understand each other and truly to create an international sensitium here. Additionally, with respect to the infrastructure, it's incredible how much you all have done in terms of adding the new buildings and the capital um, that that will bring. However, um, would you consider possibly expanding out into like building an aqueduct type or a arch or with like a mini tunnel and uh, expanding out over River Road um, to add additional uh, space for laboratories, um, research, um, and just to support the ongoing growth while also rebuilding the um, facade and also the, um, the brick and mortar of the wonderful uh, gatehouse that uh, represented the Stevens history that um, was very much true to the spirit and the foundation on which this university was built. Thank you. Sure, thank you very much and thank you for your kind words in the beginning. Um, uh, you asked essentially two questions. One is um, related to diversity and equity and uh, additional focused effort uh, to reach out to perhaps the underserved communities and provide opportunities to them. And secondly, about the infrastructure, plans for further growth and you came up with some interesting ideas that sounded very good to my ear, but I hadn't thought about them. An arch over a River Street, uh, which probably requires a conversation between you and some of our facilities people. Uh, but let's go to the first question first. We are believers that talent 
is distributed uniformly in the world. In any community you go, there are certain number of people, certain percentage of people who are unusually talented people, the kind of people that if you give them opportunity, they can change the world. We are also believers that opportunity is not distributed uniformly in the world. And because of that, in a <clears throat> very interesting study that I personally did recently, I computed the total number of Nobel laureates from Afghanistan versus the total number of Nobel laureates from a much smaller country called Austria. There is no difference from Afghanistan. The total number of Nobel laureates over the years is equal to zero. And if you look at the number of Nobel laureates from Austria, which is a relatively small country with a population of a little less than 10 million, uh, 10 million people, it's astonishing. So what explains this? I hope no one here draws the conclusion that the people in Afghanistan are unable, unable and the people in Austria are incredibly smart. No. The infrastructure, the environment in Austria is much more conducive to becoming successful. So it is with that spirit, it is with that belief that we launched a program five years ago at Stevens to identify talent when this talent is still young, especially talent that resides in underserved communities, talent in the poor neighborhoods of Newark and Jersey City and Patterson and Washington DC and New York City and Chicago. And we established a program which has a nice name. It's called Stevens ACES. ACES is an acronym, Accessing Careers in Engineering and Science. And we said, we will take opportunity to these talented people. So part of the reason for the success that you saw, almost a doubling, it's actually much more than doubling, because if you remember from our numbers, we went from 11% to 19% uh, or something like that. But it was 11% of a much smaller population. We grew a lot. <clears throat> so the program that we have created is a program whereby we build partnerships with high schools that reside in underserved communities. We tell high schools, you identify your talented students, we take care of them. So we do essentially two things for these high school students. When they're high school students, we bring them to Stevens, to a Stevens summer program completely free. We work very hard to raise money to support these students because these students typically come from families that do not have two pennies to rub together. Many of these students are underrepresented minorities, by the way. We bring them to Stevens, open up their horizons, let them know what college life is like, let them know what kind of a successful career they can have if they go to a place like Stevens, successfully finish their studies and join the workforce. And then we keep in touch with them while they're in high school. We support them. We give them prep courses on their math skills. We give them prep courses for the SAT. We teach them how to fill out an application form. We let them know how financial aid works in colleges and universities. And if they apply to Stevens and get admitted, we go out of our way to try and provide a higher level of financial aid to them because without that, they won't be able to come. So I think that's a very powerful concept. It is, you, you see the evidence that it's working and we're not going to stop um, until we become more successful in this area. I must tell you, this is a very, very expensive program. You know, Stevens is not an inexpensive place. Our tuition and fees are now approaching $60,000. If you want to come to Stevens, between tuition and fees and room and board, it's a major undertaking. Families from those underserved communities can't afford to do this. So it is our job, it's our responsibility to raise money from people who have made it successfully and enable these kids. In terms of uh, your, the, the second part of your question, which had to do with the infrastructure, I think I've already alluded to what our plans are. Um, I, I don't think we have any plans for building a new building in the immediate future because we're kind of tired of construction on campus. But we have uh, 
we have a whole host of renovation projects that are on their way and many, many more that will start soon. So these are uh, existing buildings on campus that are old, that are, that are not in great shape, and we're renovating them, bringing them to um, good shape. In terms of your idea, I need to maybe speak with you or have somebody else speak with you to see what, what exactly you have in mind. You, you might be up to some great ideas that we haven't thought about. Uh, and I was delighted to hear that you were in my inauguration event and you still remember it. Um, there was a question back there. Yes. Thank you very much for your uh, <clears throat> beautiful presentation. Uh, one of the questions I had was <clears throat> the students themselves. Uh, I'm speaking from my personal experience growing up. I was an introvert, but I was a thinker. And I had many ideas. And, you know, I wouldn't speak them out. And some of them just died. But then, Later on, after my first job, that's what turned me to become an extrovert, which is where I am today. Eventually, I became an entrepreneur, which I am still today. Uh, I don't know if Stevens has a program for students, because it's an, the students have this vast capability of thinking. And some of those ideas if it's in an introvert, will not come out and die. So I don't know if students can go into this program or have a drop box where ideas can be dropped in. And some of them could be innovative and you know, be a breakthrough uh, out there. So if those ideas can be looked at and those students be mentored and they can work towards that, and even eventually help to get a patent. So I don't know if student, I mean, Stevens had a program like that. Um, the answer is yes, but let me start by uh, saying that uh, uh, you are speaking to a diehard introvert, myself. And if you were able to convert yourself from an introvert to an extrovert, I'd like to know how you did it because I've been trying very hard for many years and I haven't been so successful. But having said that, I don't think we have the idea of a Dropbox where students can, can put a, uh, their ideas in there. I, I haven't heard and if it exists, uh, I'm not aware of it. But we do have a lot of, uh, a whole host of programs uh, that uh, allow the students to work on ideas that they come up with and we give them the support they need in order to um, uh, focus on their ideas and hopefully bring their ideas to fruition. One specific um, such program that uh, is now run completely centrally from the office of the provost and therefore it's available to students regardless of major is called Launchpad. And uh, in fact, uh, today, I met with one of our students who is a junior and she volunteered to tell me that she's a Launchpad student. She came up with an idea for developing a ma uh, an app for uh, diabetic patients. Uh, she joined the La Launchpad program to see if they would be able to support her to further develop this idea. And she told me that over the summer, this app has been developed. Uh, she's working with a, a PhD student to, because she needs more sophistication, and uh, so this is just one example of how that thing works. We have created a new program, uh, it's about four years old, it's called iSTEM. It's actually a program specifically designed for students who have an, uh, whose brains are wired differently. And you know, there are certain students who really don't care about their grades, but they're brilliant. They are problem solver, solvers. They, their mind is focused on things that have nothing to do with their academic performance. And because of that, sometimes uh, they suffer in, in their grades. Sometimes they don't even get admitted to the best universities because what, even when they were in high schools, they didn't do very well. I, I know many of them myself. So we've designed a program specifically for those kids who have a brain 
um, designed, or not designed, a brain uh, configured to be a problem solver. And we bring these students, we bring 10 such students every year to the university, and then we invite others who want to join them to do so. And these students all are interested in solving some of the largest, um, some of the most vexing uh, human problems. And uh, it's amazing if you sit down and listen to some of their presentations, you say, wow, these are undergraduate students. So yes, there are many venues for students to channel their, their ideas. It is a couple of minutes past two o'clock and I think I had only one hour. So I wanna thank you again. I appreciate it and I look forward to seeing you around maybe at the soccer game or the volleyball game. Take good care, thank you.